number 12. Hi everyone, welcome to 2014, aka the year where mascot horror was born and simultaneously peaked. The early years of this subgenre were significantly better than whatever's happening right now. Opila Bird don't come. It started with the release of Five Nights at Freddy's, a brilliant subversion of typical horror games where you're stuck in one spot and the scary is coming to you and will probably get its own video at some point. Then there's Tattletale, which came out two years after and, well, you already know where I stand on this game. But there's one other game that came out on the exact same year FNAF came out. One, I'd argue, is the single best experience in the mascot horror subgenre, and it really isn't even close. This game is Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion, or Spooky's House of Jump Scares, if you prefer. This game is like a love letter to horror, and contains some of the most unique characters ever crafted. Couple that with a goofy sense of humor and a deceptively rich universe, and you get a masterpiece. So in this video, I would like to share with you why I think Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion is a phenomenal game, and share with you just how unique it is. So let's get started. Also, this video mainly covers the HE renovation, so if you came for OG Spookies, oh well. You take the role of an urban explorer that wants to learn the origins of an old, derelict mansion. Without checking the Steam page and seeing this is a horror game, you head in to explore. When inside, a small blue ghost girl named Spooky descends from the ceiling. She challenges you to go through 1,000 rooms and then levitates back up through the ceiling. So there you've received the main objective of the game. Navigate to the thousandth room and emerge alive. Progressing in this game is very simple. Just enter a room, find a door that isn't locked or broken, and walk through. Seems simple enough. Walking through, you'll meet the first enemy of the game, Specimen 1. If Spooky is the heart of this mansion, then the specimens are the liver and gallbladder. And the first specimen is a cardboard cutout that pops out at you from the walls. Yeah, there really aren't any jump scares in this game barring this, so Specimen 1 is essentially the entire reason why jump scare is in the title. I love them because they completely subvert the player's expectation. Going through 27 rooms of nothing just to be met with a silly little tree stump. At this point, after seeing spooky and the goofy cardboard jump scares, it lowers the player's guard and makes them wonder if this game is actually supposed to be scary. It's also a self-aware jab that jump scares usually aren't really that scary. They're, they're just loud, cheap spooks that happen when you surprise the player, reflected by Specimen 1 being a loud, cheap spook that surprises the player. Anyways, let's analyze this thing, because yes, there actually is stuff to analyze. I love how it's introduced as the first specimen in the game and it can show up in nearly every room after it, even when there are other specimens chasing you. It will stop you if you walk into it, so you'll have to take into consideration if you're running from something else. I love it design-wise and how it makes fun of jump scares that this genre has a tendency to overuse. The in-universe wiki describes it as a cardboard cutout that can only kill via heart attacks, which... I mean, yeah, what else is it going to do? At this stage in the game, you'll begin running into notes. The ones here are left by a thirsty man who's gotten lost, despite only having gone, like, 40 rooms in. He's leaving a trail of notes to prove to himself that he's not going in circles, and subsequent notes show him getting steadily more paranoid and desperate, being extremely thirsty and all. He even mistakes a vial of a vial of ichor for red wine and drinks it, and when he's out of hope, he drinks the ink he used to write the notes. You can find his skeletal yet provocatively posed corpse in the corner of the elevator on floor 300. <laughs> But now, humble viewer, it is time for me to introduce you to the first real threat of the game. On floor 60, you'll find a puddle of green goo that slows you down when walking through it. On the far side of the room is a table with a note that reads, Spouting, splashing, soaking, innards, ingest, invoking, nailing, never stops the choking. <coughs> Putting the note down causes the first threat of the game to rise out of the pile of goo. His name, Specimen 2, or Goop, or Jelly, depending on who you ask. I'm calling him Jelly. Jelly is a floating humanoid goo monster with a gaping maw, piano key teeth, no nose, no eyes, and a tail. He takes obvious inspiration from the love gloves from Adventure Time. Jelly's design is alright. And its theme song is also alright. It doesn't try anything crazy, and I guess that kind of makes sense given it's the first monster. 
but it's still just painfully average and not at all indicative of the chaos to come. Jelly has a solid introduction. Up until this point, the game lulls the player into a false sense of security with its cutesy aesthetics. So reading this note with dark red text and seeing this thing rise out of the green goo that they probably walked through just a second ago is a good introduction. The chase is also interesting, even if it hurts my unga bunga hold forward and go fast brain. Jelly traps you with puddles of goo that slow down the player significantly. And I love how he himself becomes a puddle to slip under doors. He even slaps the f out of you. Nice. When he kills you, he suddenly grows eyes and more mouths, and you get a neat little bit of text coming from the specimen itself. I don't really have much emotional attachment to this thing, so I don't care too much to try and speculate what this means. Maybe we are one, but I am many means. The true specimen is the green goo, and it spreads to multiple people, kind of like a zombie infection. The name of its chase theme is Unknown Hug, so it implies that it assimilates people. I don't know. I'm not a gel head. If you're a gel head in the comments, please tell me why this guy is the greatest thing ever invented. Overall, Jelly is not much besides a stock standard introductory monster. Not good, but not bad either. Sometimes you can come across rooms with special features. After escaping Jelly, I came across a giant brain in a tank, a Simon Says room, and a room that shows the mansion is constantly shifting and changing. Simon Says is simple. You just have to test a direction until the game rewards you with the exit. The brain in the tank is funny because if you use the axe that you get later to break the glass on the tank, the brain will leave the tank and levitate into you, killing you instantly. Unironically the most dangerous thing in the game. There's also this really long hallway that is a complete and total trap designed to waste your time and kill you, but I'll talk about that later. There's also something important that I've learned. Any specimen that you previously met can return at any moment to chase you again, which I'm calling a rechase. My first rechase happened at floor 90 when Jelly came back and chased me to the elevator. Uh, the elevators are safe spaces by the way. Floor 113 had arcade machines which I played way longer than I should have. I also got a new high score that Spooky beat six times. Then Jelly appeared for a single room before getting cut off by a new specimen locale. Get a big spider. This isn't a mansion. The walls are steel and there's incubation tanks with dinosaur heads. Looks like a brain is on the loose. Generic lab assistant is saying that subject 5 is upset and Spooky doesn't care. Surely they'll leave a keycard right next to this note, which lets me access a new room. Oh, there's a hole in the ceiling. Certainly a hulking spider centipede monster isn't going to slink down from that hole in the ceiling and consume me while I'm still alive after I read this note. That would be horrible. Aw oh man, exactly that. So, Specimen 3, or Subject 5, is an enormous spider creature with multiple segments. What I find scary about this guy is the sheer size and speed of it. If I don't know it's chasing me and it slinks down from a hole in the ceiling right in front of me, it always gives me a mini heart attack. Its music is kinda like Jelly's, where there's nothing too special about it, at least to me. Just a standard eerie tune with lots of clicks. I don't have arachnophobia or entomophobia, so Spidey's design here didn't really unnerve me. In fact, I found him weirdly cute, in the same way you'd find a grizzly bear cute. It has a nice introductory locale, and it gives you a peek into the background of the mansion. This was a place where people worked, where people studied. We're nowhere near the full picture here, but at this point we know that this was once populated with people. Spidey is implied to have broken out of his tank due to lack of sedatives and started turning this section of the mansion into its nest, killing and eating anything organic as a means to satisfy its hunger. It can ambush you from holes in the ceiling and if there are no holes in the ceiling for that room, it just breaks down the door, which is kind of funny. As I previously mentioned, it is fast and if it gets too close, it bites you and scampers away. Another reason why I find it cute. You can hit him with the axe in self-defense. Unfortunately, he has the skin of adamantium, so it doesn't really hurt him, but it makes him run away. So yeah, Spidey's a monster. Better than Jelly, but that's not a particularly high bar. The only thing truly great about Spidey is its death scene. So when you die to Spidey, you get taken to a room where the following happens.
So yeah, a couple things. Why does this mediocre specimen have an S tier death scene? Maybe even better than all the others? How many of these things are there? Is it reproducing? And if so, how fast? Is this thing trying to make the entire mansion its hive with all of these holes it's making? In the end, Spidey is a mediocre monster that for no reason whatsoever has a stellar death scene, which alone makes me interested in him. I like him. By the time you escape, you've probably reached room 150, and get ready, because things are about to ramp up. When I reached room 160, I could feel my heart drop as there was a new tension in the air. Take a guess at why. Yep, they sent me back to school. They even revoked my rights to my peripheral vision, which sucks. I don't know what it is about abandoned schools, but I hate them. There's this feeling of I'm not supposed to be here, coupled with the feeling of something's terribly wrong that makes it so terribly effective. Never mind the completely out of nowhere tonal shift of being plunged into complete darkness. You can snoop around the school and find classrooms where ghostly apparitions stand, unmoving. If you get close, they will strike. You find notes that you can hardly read because of the flashlight is shining all the way down there, describing a lost girl. Matsuri never came to class today. I hope she made it home okay. And another note in a different classroom. Could it really be true? I thought the fairy tales about the ghost that eats children who sneak in after class was just to keep us from disobeying. But Matsuri is still missing. We then have to wander through a couple rooms in agonizing silence, listening for anything to happen, and then finally... I'm on my way to Flavortown! Ringu is when the game gets really good. Let's start with her design. She's a pale ghost girl with deathly black eyes, black hair, blood... <clears throat> Icor, E, fingers, and a flowing gray dress. She has old TV-esque scan lines, which makes sense as she pays homage to the ring. She talks to the player and has music that is actually genius. When I listen to this song, I can't help but think the melody sounds like an alarm clock. Take a listen. But it makes complete sense. The notes prior to this talk about a ghost that eats those who are late to class. So it must sound like an alarm because, well, you actually set your alarm too late and were late for class. This might sound like a stupid line to draw until you find out that the song is literally named Breakfast Was Too Late. Your Honor, I rest my case. Time to head to school at 4 p.m. Hi there, viewer. Nice to see you here. Hello, Ringu, looking disgustingly terrifying as ever. How's the macular degeneration coming? Shut the f up. Hey, aren't there supposed to be four people in this class? So look, Ringu has phenomenal sound design and great character design. She also has an incredible introduction. So is there anything that she doesn't do great? Well, her death scene sucks. Ringu devouring the player like this is stomach turningly chilling, but hush now, my child, you're safe now and Ringu holding her belly just doesn't scare me, like, at all. Maybe somebody out there finds this scary, but I just think it's lackluster. She has a cool animation in that the closer she draws to you, the wider her mouth opens, and you can see she has literal fangs. My favorite part about that is if you go through the door, just as she reaches you, she just kind of looks at you shocked with her mouth slightly open. She can fly over pits and face through walls. It's really just an all-around great specimen. Can't wait to never see her on a rechase again and just constantly get jelly. I then found the cat DOS machine, where I could see information relating to all the specimens. I could see specimens 1 through 4 and a little teaser for what's to come. Specimens 5 and 6. Apparently specimen 6 is the most effective killer of everyone here. Wonder what his shtick is. On room 210, the room layout once again takes a turn for the darker. You get a little static overlay. The environment now looks old and industrial. There are rusty panels on the ground and heavy steel doors. Overall, a pretty revolting locale. Cool. 
The majority of the doors are broken, but the individual rooms in this place are the most disgusting in the game, so I'm fine with going into as few rooms as possible. The notes in the rooms tell a story about a cult worshipping its mother, who seems to be getting increasingly agitated. Things worsen when the cult sacrificed a girl, not knowing she wasn't pure. The whole place mixes organic, fleshy materials with a rusty iron layout. There's a weird flesh curtain, a mummified man trapped against the wall, and who could forget? The womb room. We're not talking about it. You must be drawing parallels between this place and the previous specimen locales. And yeah, there's a specimen here. Hiding in a little gated area is our friend Specimen 5, which I nicknamed Strawby. Strawby and her locale take clear inspiration from Silent Hill 2. Strawby herself looks a lot like the nurses and wields Pyramid Head's weapon. Her design is incredibly unorthodox. She's humanoid, but extremely polygonal and has so many inhuman features, weird angles, no orifices, and holes in her face. So, I guess... She does have orifices. Let's move on. The sounds she makes perfectly reflect the environment you found her in, being incredibly machine-like while also being very biological or organic. I don't know how to describe it. Ah, such a way with words. Her chase theme is called Lusting Strawberry, aka the entire reason why I call her Strawby. The chase theme itself is really good, and actually kind of a bop. Who knew you could make labored breathing to the beat of a heart sound good? Grandpa, take notes. Later in the track, you get this weird droning moan sound that perfectly coincides with the crazy visuals that we'll get into in a sec. This thing really makes you feel like you're going insane. Strawby's introduction was great. As I said previously, her locale is sickening, and watching her open up a gate to begin chasing you is really cool. She does this thing where she makes the environment around you all warped and unbelievable to look at. It's so interesting to me that just being near Strawby has a sort of breaking effect on the human mind. You hallucinate images of her as you enter a room. She leaves after images. It feels like you're looking at something that's just impossible, so your mind does its best to approximate what you're looking at, and doing a horrible job at that. Hey Jesus, it's sure nice being safe, here, in this church. Wait, you're not Jesus, you're Strawby. Oh no, why do the tags say mind break? That can't be right. There are ads in this video, hopefully. I feel like this is subliminal messaging. Her cat Doss describes her as being particularly potent against individuals with mental issues and weak wills, which makes sense considering the mind-breaking effect. Also, something interesting is that this specimen hits way harder than most all other specimens, but how she kills you is completely unknown, and when you die, yeah, I don't know what's happening here. Great death scene, by the way. Overall, I find Specimen 5 to be a perfectly realized specimen. It excels in almost every way, and I found it sad that she never showed up to re-chase me. On floor 228 and 229, I read the Ink Drinker guy's last notes, and honestly, it's sad to see him lose hope like this. On floor 250, you meet Spooky again, who congratulates you and gives you a gift. Did I mention I love this game's sense of humor? Around this point, we begin finding notes from a new perspective. This new guy has main character syndrome. Insert obscure horror reference that no one gets and misinterprets as instructions somehow. Imagine being a game developer knowing that there are going to be idiot let's players that will one day be playing your game. It's free publicity, yeah, but just imagining someone interpreting something infuriatingly wrong has got to be an annoying feeling. Better ingredients, better pasta, that's the power of the Home Depot. Room 310 is super different from most of what you've seen thus far. It felt like I just stepped into a Zelda dungeon. Tall walls, brown brickwork, large square doors, and burning torches. There are counters laden with metal tools, keys, and notes. The notes tell a story about an unusual man that blew into town one day. He sold puppets and trinkets to children. 
which made the other shopkeeps in town mad, as he was the center of attention and stole their business. So they threw all his precious puppets into the river. The man caught wind of this and came running after them, crying that his children were being drowned. He dove into the water, and never again did he emerge. And the townspeople were happy. Dang, that's cold. Years later, the children of the town began to go missing. Puppets of their likeness were found in the forest and around the river. So, uh, yeah, this next specimen literally turns people into puppets. Before moving on to the specimen, I'd like to say, I really miss the days of creepy pasta. I miss the days where anybody could take anything and think, yeah, I'll make this scary. Most of the time they fail dramatically, but there was this endearing draw towards an overly edgy story about this innocent thing that becomes an overpowered killer. One of the most famous creepypasta of all time is the story of Ben Drowned, a haunted Majora's Mask copy that the protagonist bought at a garage sale. It tells the story of a boy that was drowned by his dramatic, substance-abusing father and haunts the protagonist as an unmoving statue that always seems to appear right behind him. Now that that's out of the way, let's take a look at this overpowered killer that drowned and constantly appears right behind you. Specimen 6, or Ben the Merchant, is a tall, puppet man wearing gray pants and a brown tunic. In his hand, he holds a long, sharp needle. When I first arrived, I was confused. Like, why is this giant puppet man staring at me with a look of pure malice? But then it hit me, like a needle through my optic nerve. This guy is the equivalent of the phrase, teleports behind you, nothing personnel, kid. I love how much of a departure this design is from the previous ones. The previous humanoid monsters kept their proportions realistic and smooth, but Ben is unapologetically polygonal and abstract. The overall roughness of his body only increases my appreciation for it. He's a puppet. You can even see his strings if you look hard enough. His introduction wasn't quite as scary as the previous two, but I love how in your face and not subtle these rooms are. Everything is out in the open. Even his room is decorated with his victims. This face is the face of, hmm, where should I put this one? Having him being introduced in the center of the room instead of behind you or off to the side is genius. It's like he knows he's the boss of his own dungeon. His music also stands out way more than the others. It's way louder and it gets darker as time goes on. Absolutely nothing about this guy is trying to hide anything. He has nothing but sinister intentions and even taunts the player in some of his poses, poorly hiding his needle and innocently waving with his other hand. None of the other specimens have such a pronounced personality, which makes sense given this thing's giant face with huge expressive eyes and a giant mouth. A good portion of specimens don't even have eyes, or a mouth, or either. Ben throws all subtlety out the window and wears his cruelty with pride, and I live for it. He doesn't even talk to you, he just laughs at you. Now the chase itself confuses me. I get what they were going for with this chase. You have to look at him to stop him from moving. Woo woo peanut. But usually he doesn't move when you look away, and when you are looking, he moves anyway. I think his whole thing is that he moves faster when you look away, and that still gives him the option to drop down behind you while you're looking at him. I'll be honest, when I got chased by this specimen, I never felt like I was in danger. Even when I wasn't looking at him, most of the time I could make it to the next room anyway. If you ever get hit, it's easy to just heal off the hit by staring at him. The only time you're really in danger is when you enter a new room and have a split second to turn around. The only change I can think of giving him is to just make him move faster. Shorten the time between when he gets pulled into the ceiling to attack you again, or maybe make it a reaction test where you hear his laugh and you have to spin around. I don't know. In the end, I still love this guy because he always scares the out of me whenever he shows up for a rechase and I'm not prepared to have my eyes gouged out. Speaking of eyes gouged out, Yeah, he starts his puppification process by blinding you, go figure. This death screen is the most iconic in all of Spookies, and gee, I wonder why. I think it has a similar problem with Ringu's in that 
the first part is great, but the text is just... Most of the deaths have some incredibly poetic text to share, but these just don't. They do both get fixed in the Dollhouse DLC, which I won't go over in this video, but I want to bring it up here because, Jesus Christ, they are so good. Hitting him with the axe cripples him, which is hilarious, and I love his winning smile. Fantastic specimen. Let's move on. Sometimes you get this weird room with a note. I have no idea what it means. It's designed solely for a jump scare that you have to undergo to unlock a door. Right after this, I found a desk that is clearly made to be a jab at Five Nights at Freddy's. Um, hello, uh, um. Eventually, my medication stopped working, and I had to consult with my feline therapist. And, uh, I'll be completely upfront here. Everything here is part of Specimen 7. So, uh, cue transition. Specimen 7, or the Wall of Flesh, is the most nuanced specimen out of them all. Let's take a look at what the game has to say about it to get a better understanding of it. Specimen is constantly changing form and attributes, depending on subject's personality, but most common form resembles a wall of moving anatomy symbols. Only effective on subjects with past trauma or a history of psychological issues. Okay, that's cool and all, but what does it have to do with this little pink cat that's giving me a therapy session? Well, it's a little complicated. Ever since you stepped across that red dotted line, you've fallen under its effects. Though, what it is, there isn't one single correct answer. There's a collection of rooms that you go through to learn more about it, and most of them feature the pink cat as well as some strange red things for a lack of a better term. The cat is encouraging you to be your true self and to find freedom, while the red things seem to want the opposite from you. The cat guides you through certain surreal areas, including a divided room with a compass, an office in which the only monitor is telling you to ignore the cat's teachings, the depths of space, and the void. Every room with the cat is a safe space, where the specimen seems to be trying all it can to break in and affect you but eventually you have to leave the cat and be on your own once again. So what was that? Well, there are many ways to look at it because this specimen is interpretive by nature, but the way I understand the pink cat was therapy. The wall of flesh is only effective against those with psychological issues, while the cat uses its power to suppress the darkness of the wall to create a safe space and give those who fall under its spell the encouragement that they'll need in order to beat it. I don't know if that means the pink cat is like the antithesis of the wall, like it's the other side of the coin that is specimen 7. Again, this specimen is interpretive by nature, so your theory on the relationship between the cat and the wall may be different than mine. This specimen is brilliant in that it's the only explicitly internal war that you fight. Other specimens will claw at or bite you, but this specimen wages war on your psyche. Anyone coming face to face with Ringu would be terrified and frantic, sure. But when they come face to face with the wall of flesh, they would be torn at the seams, seeing their worst nightmares, worst memories, seeing their despair, their regrets, and their trauma manifesting on the literal walls of this maze in a killing blow of psychological torture. To get lost in the dark is to lose faith in yourself, and to become assimilated by the wall is to give up. To lose yourself entirely. To come face to face with your truest, deepest, darkest fears and to come back stronger. That is what this specimen is all about. Don't get lost in the maze. Don't pay attention to the pictures on the walls. And don't give in to the nightmare behind you. Also, its theme song is a bop. So, thematically, this mess- Specimen? So, thematically, the specimen works to great effect, but what about the gameplay? Eh, the chase is lackluster, the maze is too straightforward and not nearly intricate enough to get lost in, and the wall itself is super slow. Grotesque images do appear on the walls, but uh, the protagonist has really strange fears. I feel like the specimen is so close to perfection, but it's just... It just barely isn't there in the gameplay department. What I'd change about it is, for one, I'd give it a death screen because why doesn't it have one of those? Two, I'd do what Shrabi did and leave little hallucinations of other specimens inside the maze. Three, I'd speed it up by 50% and have it dox your home address if it catches you to add some real tension. 
This is a specimen that Akuma Kira made that, as far as I know, wasn't really based off of anything else, and I'm glad it works so well. It probably doesn't work so well to someone that doesn't feel like reading in between the lines. I mean, my first run through, I thought this specimen was boring. But yeah, the wall of flesh. Love what they did with this specimen. After this, I got jump scared so hard, my soul left my body. Times like those, I really wish I recorded my voice. The whole reason why I didn't record my voice is because I've been incredibly sick. I wanted to record and upload it to my second channel just like I wanted to upload the full Tattletale playthrough before it was lost. I swear, everything about that channel is cursed. Somewhere around this time, I ran into a new note left by a new person who's on his second day in the mansion. I don't really care about his journey, so this is going to be the last time I refer to him. When reaching floor 500, Spooky floated down from the ceiling and congratulated me in a way only Spooky could. I then got my progress yoinked out from under me as the door led back to floor 51. I found Jelly's introduction room again and was ready to be chased. I was clearly fed up in the recording because I picked up the paper, frustratedly put it back down, realized it was different, and picked it back up again. Right after this is the express tunnel that takes me back to floor 512, and the deletes your progress joke doesn't overstay its welcome. Room 550 is super, super different from what you're used to in that, wow, I am touching the grass. This next locale can be characterized by its cozy yet desolate foresty log cabin -y feel, with intermittent periods of going outside and interacting with belligerent omnivorous deer. They're so cute though! Notes between cabins are from the perspective of a man that attempted to kill a deer but ended up being hunted instead of the hunter, having to board up the cottage in order to keep them from finishing him off. On the ground next to the note are two skulls, so uh... Wonder how that turned out for him. Room 554 is when we get introduced to a game-changing new mechanic, the axe. You can kill the deer and watch them flop around, and use it to attack specimens. The utility of which varies from specimen to specimen. Most don't care about the axe, and the ones it does work on, it doesn't do a whole lot. Barring Ben, who crumbles through the floor like a stupid idiot. Anyways, I got jump scared to hell again, and I found a pulsing blue two-dimensional key. I remember the last time I found a key, it went terribly. Hopefully things are different this time. Ah, uh, never mind. That's a transition. Dear God, everything about this guy works. Okay, let's start with design. The Dear God is tall, imposing, with piercing white eyes, eight long, sharp antlers, sharp teeth, a black cloak that he opens up when nearby, exposing his rib cage, and the souls of those come before you, and a ring of shadows at his feet. Strongest design in the game, don't at me. His music is great, and one of the few tracks that I honestly listen to outside of the game. When I hear it, I'm transported to an old log cabin surrounded by mist with a record spinning, looking out and seeing a humanoid silhouette amidst the fog. I simply adore the fact that he calls you a for running. He's easily the most vocal specimen in the game. His introduction of actually having the player touch grass for once is genius, as having the player be outside is such an insane departure from what the player is used to. Seeing him come out of the dark hallway made my heart drop. And though his introduction wasn't quite as perfect in execution as Ringu's, who I believe had the best, it was close. The old VHS static overlay fits so well with the Deer Lord and just, wow. Everything design-wise from sound to visual is just perfect. So what about gameplay? Does it hold up mechanically? Uh, yeah, this is easily the most dangerous specimen we've encountered yet. While it isn't anywhere near the speed of the player, it makes up for it in a brilliant way. Yup, when a wall obstructs his pathing, he activates no clip and switches between his dimension and ours. He essentially activates 900% speed when there's a wall in his way, and it creates the single greatest visual effect in the game. The only counterbalance to this is to carefully guide him around corners as to keep him from activating super speed. So in other words, in rooms where you have to navigate hallways, you have to move slow and be precise as to not activate his trap card. He's amazing design-wise, and he's amazing gameplay-wise. Maybe he has a bad death screen to counterbalance his overall greatness? Uh, no. His death scene is top tier, on par with Spidey's Land of Dreams. You're on a straight path walking through a forest of tall, gnarled black trees, all underneath a vermilion sky. There is no way to deviate from this path. You can only go forward. 
At the end of the path is the Deer God, waiting with his cloak open for you to join the tortured souls he's assimilated before you. I also love how he's incredibly tall in his own dimension. His cat Doss describes him as some sort of peacekeeping deity, which makes sense as he probably thought you were a violent subject ever since you picked up the axe. When you come in contact with him, your vision is flooded with subliminal messaging. I distinctly remember a time where I got disoriented by this and ended up going the wrong way, right back to the door I came from. I can't get over how great this thing is. He's just so good. Hey Ringu, can you add this to my list of favorite things? Wait, that place sucks. Whose idea was it to go to Burger King? Oh. So yeah, specimen eight, dear God, dear God, my favorite specimen in the game. He just like me, tall, skeletal, sharp antlers, keep souls. If there's ever a Spookies movie, I want to play Dear God. Akuma Kira, consider this my application. Anyway, Specimen 9 is the final boss, we'll talk about him later. Specimen 10 is based off of The Thing. A movie impossible to take seriously in this post-Among Us world. His locale is similar to Spidey's intro locale, but with significantly more advanced technology. And as it turns out, this was the old GL Labs. It was abandoned because of our sussy friend, The Thing. He's in the vents. Something Among Us would steal three years later. Also, I'd like to bring attention to this moment. Brilliant. The lights are cued to go off at the exact perfect time. Time enough for the player to see and process the vent with a trail of ichor leading to it. The inside of the vents is cramped and uncomfortable. This place is designed to make you feel vulnerable, and it doesn't help that this weird, fleshy, organic web is growing in the vents. Also, this happens. Notes around the vents describe it as an infection that grows on your skin and takes over your body. When you finally leave the vents, on the floor is a note warning you about the nature of the specimen. You have to keep it close. It becomes something else when it gets too far away. Something I can't outrun. Specimen 10, or The Thing, is a parasite from space. It's shown to be able to shapeshift and spread between multiple hosts. When it finds a host, it gnarls their flesh and mutates their body, giving them a grotesque, melted look. The specimen we encounter has three forms. A leech form, a regular form, and a close proximity form. When close to you, it draws back its flesh, revealing a gaping mouth with rows of sharp teeth. Its regular form is... a horrifically drawn crewmate, and its leech form is what happens when you try to run away from it. The leech is the fastest enemy in the game and cannot be underestimated. Sound design is effective, making subtle gurgling noises and deep breathing noises. Its music is extremely slow and melancholy, with what I can only describe as various biological noises adding to the atmosphere. I swear, it feels like parts of this song were recorded in someone's intestines. But the music could not be more fitting for something so slow and sickly that demands you also go slow. During the chase, it messes with your vision, and if you get hit, you start seeing a pale yellow curtain around the borders of your screen. This specimen has a really cool focus on biology and what makes us human, reflected by its death screen, telling you to revert back to your selfish animal instincts. Give up what makes you human. Become monkey, it's much easier. Juxtaposed by the binary, which translates to you are more than just an animal. Use the soul you've been given and be responsible for your actions. That voice is the last traces of your humanity. It's in binary because you can't understand it anymore. Your mind has been taken over by the parasite. So at this point, I gotta ask, is the person inside this still alive? If so, can they think? Are they aware of their surroundings or how their body was mutilated and being used by some invader? That's a terrifying concept, having your body being taken over and used by some putrid parasite to spread more of itself, but being conscious of it. As for its introduction, it was fine. One of the weaker locales in my opinion. There could have been more vent sections where you get to see more of what this parasite is capable of other than webs and the little vent goblin. Maybe you could have a section where something enters the vents behind you. As for the introduction where you meet the specimen itself, I love how it kills and steps out of this giant eel head thing, which, fun fact, was the original specimen 10 before they realized it wasn't scary. The eel has a cat DOS entry that describe it as a genetically modified eel that was supposed to be deadly, but ended up as more of a friendly pet than anything else. 
It's fitting how we see Specimen 10 literally step out of a hole in the original Specimen 10 skull. Its entire specimen shtick was explained in that one note. Just don't get too far from it. Kind of boring if you ask me. Again, this is my unga bunga hold L shift to run brain, but I usually don't like it when games slow me down. I think the stay close to me concept was executed in a much more interesting way with the deer god and its wall zooming ability. Still, the thing is a really cool specimen and poses even more of a threat than the deer lord if you're a brain dead moron that holds forward and can't discern that it only changes when it's far away. Cool specimen, I'm sorry I'm reviewing you in this post Among Us world. After the 18th and 19th three chase with Jelly, I found something way different from all the other locales. And I know I'm saying that a lot, but trust me on this. The fast food joint is cool. One of my favorite locales with my favorite side story. The notes are from the perspective of a new worker that recently got a job at an unnamed fast food chain when they begin to notice peculiarities surrounding customers and the staff. People will order food only to return 10 minutes later to order more food. The worker swears not to try the burgers there before eventually caving and eating one. He begins hearing unnerving things in his dreams. The next day, the manager had a fit of extreme violence and attacked an employee for saying their burgers smelled like sulfur. I don't know why, but I really feel for this random employee and hope they got out of that place safe. I love how the rules for the fun tunnel demand you be this tall. Even in these gloomy specimen locales, the game never loses its sense of humor. So, you must be wondering, huh, Pig Pig, what is the specimen for this place? Ever since Ringu, the game has been knocking it out of the park with these cool specimens. Surely this one will be good as, if not better than the others. And I ordered a single Big Mac, and the total came out to be $6.66. Specimen 11, or the Beef Demon. Beef Demon, is that really what I'm calling this thing? The Beef Demon is, uh, it's a demon, all right. I don't have a lot to say about this guy. It doesn't have the most interesting design, per se. The fire effect, empty eye sockets, and the tear trails are cool, but, um, I don't know. It's just kind of underwhelming. I don't know how it fits thematically either. Like, is there a real life scenario where a demon was found <laughs> haunting a McDonald's urn? His design is basic, and his sound design, and Music is the only thing he has going for him. He says things like, and, and his music is slow and simple, but still filled with tension. There really isn't much I can say about his introduction either. He just spawns in when you grab a key and is cooler. His chase is just Ringu again, but slightly trickier because he can mess with your vision and hide doors. He instant transmissions when you hit him with an axe. I don't know, the beef demon's design is so disappointing as his his death scene. So when killed by him, you're warped to a meat maze, and upon navigation you find him at the end. When close, you see some text. What does it mean? I don't care. The binary translates to believe in God, but question the teachings of men. Uh, God complex much? He literally does the same exact thing that the dear lord does when he kills you only it's much less effective. Having Deer Lord standing tall and mighty in the center of a path watching you draw nearer to him is so much more effective than hiding at the end of a maze. I'm sorry, I know you have self-esteem issues, but pretending to be a better specimen won't make you a better specimen. I can't help but think of this meme. I mean, think about it. Terrible posture, teleports away when hit because he's afraid of confrontation, hides in mazes, high kill count to overcompensate for low self-confidence, and a permanently outstretched hand as a result from grabbing too many french fries. Compared to the deer god with pronounced, tall, stoic posture, eats axes as a bedtime snack, stands front and center and owns it, only kills violent people, and feeds on souls for nutrition. I know I may be ripping into this guy, and I am. Go to the corner and think about what you did. He's definitely not the worst specimen. He is scary, just underwhelming. I know it's hard when you have to follow up six consecutive amazing performances, but he's just a Ringu that hides doors. Let's move on. So around this point, I made it to floor 750 and was given infinite stamina. Nice. The only downside is the sprint button was removed. I love how in conventional horror games, these safe rooms would be where the player could relax and prepare themselves. But Spooky is the polar opposite and her pranks are always so endearing to see. It's always a delight seeing how she messes with the player next. Anyways, I got scared by ambient noise, and then ice cream jump scared me. At some point, I got Dear God on a rechase, but for some reason, this chill ambient song played instead of his theme song. 
It was just a vibe. Floor 810 is the next specimen locale, but plot twist, the specimen itself is the locale. I can smell, I can smell, I can smell you. Specimen 12, or the mansion, is an old mansion that builds itself around its surroundings. How that works, I have no idea. Maybe it's like the Terraria corruption in that it's a mansion, but it slowly grows and infects more areas, eventually consuming the entire planet in one giant mansion. Those who enter the mansion experience paranoia and a growing desire to enact violence. The mansion itself claims an individual to use as a host. This host is cursed to roam the mansion for the rest of their lives, eating nothing but ghost peppers and saying the scariest lines that they spent all last night rehearsing. You'll like being dead, I promise. Down in the basement, you can see what the mansion truly looks like, without the fake Victorian aesthetic. It's dirt, and the doors are made of steel. The upstairs has a hellish red fog, while the downstairs is congested and dusty. Notes around the locale tell a story of a man slowly succumbing to the effects of the mansion. His story parallels yours in many ways, having found a weapon in the woods and hiding from a scary killer with a giant weapon. The only difference being that he successfully kills his stalker, while if you try to attack him, he parries the f*** out of you. It's probably for the best that you don't kill him, as if you do, the mansion will just make you its new host, so thanks buddy. Speaking of hiding, yeah that's a thing now. You're wasting both our time. Something interesting about the mansion is that it reacts to your progress you made through it. When exiting the mansion, its usual red fog turns green. What the green fog means, I don't know. A quick look at Wikipedia tells me that the color green is commonly associated with life, but more importantly, hope. Given that a past tragedy was implied to take place in this very mansion, perhaps it's the souls of those that are trapped in this mansion, hopeful to see you escape, hopeful to see you survive. The death screen is passable. It's just a picture of this goober with a visual and audio distortion. So the Shining Clock Tower reference mansion is pretty cool. The exact moment I escaped the host, Ben the Merchant came back for a rechase and needless to say I was fed up with his bull****. Also, room 854 was the time where the Dear Lord caught me and disoriented me into running the wrong direction. Yeah, this is one of the scariest parts of the game. But now, onto the section of the game that easily scared me the most. And when you know it, the final specimen in the game. Before the final boss. <clears throat> so the last locale can be characterized by its dark brickwork, running water, and its tank that can hold a literal whale. Even though that tail fin is vertical and not horizontal, which indicates that this is not a whale, but just a giant fish. How utterly foolish. The notes around the locale do a great job building up to the specimen. They talk about whales dying by some humanoid creature eating them from the inside, starting with the stomach. The flashlight you had that worked perfectly fine earlier is now non-existent and you have to find a lantern, which, yeah, by now you should be able to tell that this place is inspired by amnesia. Just like the specimen, but before we talk about the specimen, first we have to watch me bumble around like an idiot because I couldn't recognize a four digit code even if it's pressed against my face. A note in front of the water pump talks about something unknown, trying to lure the rider out of the safety of the lab and into the water. And when you know it, the last note can be found floating in the water. This next area is by far and away the scariest thing I've encountered in this game. Most rooms are submerged in shoulder depth water and the only relief from the water are these wooden crates littered throughout the rooms. The music for this area is phenomenal. It's atmospheric and dark, perfect for the sunken laboratory. The final note reads, all the staff is gone, only I remain. For no purpose I remain here, resisting the call from behind the sealed door. But I will remain as long as I can. Don't open that door. So watch me open the door. Specimen 13 is heavily inspired by the water monster from Amnesia. Get up! Get up! And before I talk about the chase, I want to address something. Yeah, the design is incredibly boring. It's a mermaid, but oh no, mermaid bad. What you thought was a hot fish babe is actually a Birmingham resident, but what it lacks in design, it makes up for in everything else. This section was the most terrifying part of the entire game. That feeling of watching her wake head in the direction of where you're supposed to go and not seeing any boxes ahead is intense. 
the feeling of uncertainty when you step into the water not knowing when or if it will be safe again is incredible. The moment you find a box and you have to beat her to it or you'll get attacked is crazy and it leaves me confused. Online discourse told me that this specimen sucks, so I was lulled into a false sense of security. Spookies historians in the comments, can you tell me if the siren was completely overhauled or had a big update in a recent version of the game? Or if I just have a weird taste in horror? As it stands, this is the scariest specimen in the game, at least to me. I love watching the siren patrolling the area. As if she knows you're just a sitting duck and it's only a matter of time before you jump into the water next. The entire specimen chase, it felt like I was being toyed with. It's not like she needs you to eat or anything. There's an entire whale fish thing in just the other room. Her death scene isn't anything too special. She drowns you and reveals that she's British. So yeah, the siren is great and while its design is a letdown, it makes up for it in a multitude of ways. It was at this point when I looked at the cat DOS entries for specimens 10 through 12 and found something interesting. Text underneath specimen 12's description states, proved not effective as victim souls do not remain after contact. And at this point I wondered what exactly this whole mansion was about or what were they studying here? Why are they so invested in the nature of death to the point of gathering all these hellish abominations to one place? Why are they so interested in studying souls and life itself? What is the purpose of all this human experimentation? Well, as it turns out, there is a reason. And while I do hate to lead you guys on like this, it is a pretty central element to Spooky's dollhouse, so I'll have to leave it until a later date. Oh boy, floor 985. Can't wait to get rechased by Jelly one last time. Oh, Strabi, it's been too long. While it wasn't for an incredibly long time, it was nice to have one final hurrah from none other than Strabi. Finally, I've won my freedom. Or not. Yeah, Spooky isn't happy to see you go without any permanent damages, so she decides you must take on one final challenge. The Taker is a remnant from the experiments of Unit 731. For context, Unit 731 was responsible for the most sickening human experiments known to man. Think, how do we know that the human body is comprised of 70% water? Well, our friends at Unit 731 found that out by steaming war prisoners. Alive. Yep. So this guy resembles a flayed human and acts as the final boss. The Taker, when it first arrived, was deemed impossible to contain and was taken apart until it became this floating skull thing. It has the highest kill count of any specimen and is actually capable of taking you virtually anywhere in the mansion, as long as you idle. It's neat to think that as soon as you enter the mansion, this thing is constantly chasing you, waiting for you to lower your guard. He does have his own spawn locale. It takes the form of a long hallway that is impossible to reach the end of, as once you spent too much time in the hall, he will arrive and take you. This room can spawn pretty much anywhere as an unassuming room, and is probably the biggest run ender to any curious gamer. The boss itself isn't particularly difficult. He stretches a shadow of a hand that summons more hands to try and grab you, summons screaming pillars, shoots fireballs, and spawns little jump scare goblins. You can even dead man's volley with the fireballs, these fireballs being the only way to actually damage the boss. When fireballed, he will be vulnerable, allowing the player to wail on him with the axe. As previously stated, not very difficult. I beat him by just strafing back and forth. Once you beat him, you'll get one of three endings. The good ending, the bad ending, and the joke ending. The joke ending is when you turn specimens off and Spooky is incredibly unimpressed. The good ending is when you die in a tragic way and Spooky enlists you in her army. And the bad ending is when Spooky deems you've used the axe so much that she might as well make you a specimen. So uh, cool. I guess I'm a specimen now. Egg sandwich. Anyone not liked, commented, and subscribed with notifications on gets vaporized via orbital laser.
Hey, is that an otter? Ah, thank God it's over. You know, going into this, making this review, I was not prepared for it to be as long as it took, and I was not prepared for the weeks upon weeks of 14 hour work days of just editing, editing, editing. It really makes me appreciate all the content creators that make these highly edited videos. You might be wondering, huh, your voice sounds kind of different. And yes, viewer, that is because I got a new microphone. That's right, ya boys moving up in the world. Anyways, hope you enjoyed. This has been my thoughts on Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion and why I think it's just a stellar game. I should also mention that I am unbelievably and unapologetically biased in some of my opinions. So if something that I said you didn't like, I was probably just blowing it out of proportion. Like the whole hating on Specimen 11, uh, the beef demon, that was completely played up for comedy. If you like that specimen, then I completely understand. Anyways, as far as Spookies goes, there is so much to cover. I've barely scratched the surface. And if you want to hear more of what I have to say about it, then let me know. Right now, I'm just trying to get established on YouTube, so if you could hit buttons, you know the ones, that would be very much appreciated. I've been trying some new stuff. I uh, hope you like the little skits that I put in, and I hope you like the Kuluyaku avatar that I used, the little plushie. I would much rather just use my own face, but if I just randomly showed up with my face out in one of my videos, then I can't milk it for views later down the line. 100k subs and I'll do a face reveal and come out to my parents as a YouTuber. I'm getting off topic here. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. I really do. I spent a lot of time on this video and sorry for good quality. Bye.